This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. After that, I wanted, I just wanted to leave, and uh, I noticed that the girl was still breathing, barely. I didn't want to leave her that way, so I, uh, I tried to break her neck. Can I ask you one question? Did you, when she was having this labored breathing, did you consider trying to give her a little bit of CPR yourself and then take off? Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Tanya. And I'm Talia. And we are TNT Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hey, Talia. Hi, Tanya. How you doing today? I am great. I'm super excited to hear your story. Before we do that, though, Tanya, I want everybody to just take one second, if they would be so kind, and just hit that little subscribe button or follow or whatever it is. Whatever Whatever it is. is. Thank you. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's do it then. In the early morning hours of May 25th, 1997, seven-year-old Sharice Iverson was wandering around the Prima Donna Resort in Casino in Prim, Nevada. Where's that at? It's about 40 miles south of Las Vegas, and it's really near the California border. She was dressed in an adorable sailor outfit, and she was running around because her father was busy, enjoying himself, drinking, and gambling. And she's running around the casino. The casino. And casino security had already gone to her dad and requested that he keep a better eye on Charisse. But he did not. And so she continued to explore the casino alone without any adult supervision. I'm already so angry. At about 4 a.m., Sharice encountered 18-year-old Jeremy Strohmeyer. Jeremy was at the casino with his friend, David Cash Jr., who was 17. They both were from Long Beach, California, and they were at the casino with David's father, who brought them to the area for the Memorial Day weekend. So this is 4 a.m.? Yes. The two boys found Sharice in the video game arcade where they were playing video games. Jeremy began playing hide-and-seek with Sharice in the arcade. Security cameras confirmed that Jeremy followed Sharice into a woman's bathroom at 347, and they continued their little game in the bathroom. They were throwing wet paper towels at each other, and Sharice threw a wet floor sign, those yellow ones that are set up in bathrooms, She threw that at Jeremy. Jeremy's friend David entered the bathroom after a few minutes, and he saw Jeremy force Sharice into a bathroom stall. David said he went into the adjacent stall, and he stood on top of the toilet, peeking over the wall to see what was going on. What he saw was Jeremy, with one of his hands over Sharice's mouth to muffle her cries for help, Because at this point, she's struggling to get away. This isn't any game happening. No, not at all. And he was groping her with his other hand. David tapped Jeremy on the head, and he didn't get any response because he was trying to get Jeremy to leave the bathroom and leave Sharice alone. David spent two minutes in the bathroom, according to the security footage. He wasn't just in and out. So he knows what happened. He saw what happened. He saw a lot of what happened, I would think. Two minutes is a long time. David left the bathroom, and instead of intervening again or even trying to get any help from casino security, he just strolled back into the arcade and waited for Jeremy to come out. After about 20 minutes, Jeremy calmly strolled out of the bathroom like nothing had happened. Reuniting with David, Jeremy confessed to him that he had raped and killed Charisse. That poor baby. I know. And at this point, David still doesn't go to security. Five minutes after murdering Sharice, Jeremy is seen on the security footage talking to two girls in the valet parking area. He is seen lifting up his shirt to show the girls he had a pierced nipple. And the girls, they were also from California, and that's, I think, was their common denominator. They said they remembered talking to Jeremy, like later on, because he was so weird. He gave them the creeps. He is showing them his pierced nipple in the parking lot. Yes. Who does that? 
So basically what you're telling me is just a few minutes after a uh, rape and murder of a little girl, he is flirting with two girls out in the parking lot. Three days later, Jeremy was arrested when two of his classmates in Long Beach recognized him from the security footage from the casino. It was released to the media and they saw it on TV. He had been put under surveillance by the police and was arrested at his home after trying to elude them by running out of his house and running down the street, like right when they were getting ready to swoop in. When they apprehended him and returned to his house, they were waiting for a search warrant. Jeremy's mother showed the police an empty pill bottle that had formerly held 37 Dexedrine pills. Dexedrine is a medication that was prescribed to Jeremy for his ADHD, and it's an amphetamine. Along with the empty pill bottle, Jeremy's mother held a suicide note that Jeremy had written. The note said, quote, I am so sorry. I just pray that this is enough to finish me off. Please, Lord, let me die. I'm sorry, Mom. I'm sorry, Dad, Heather, who was his sister, all my friends and family. Forgive me, for I have sinned. I'm sorry. Please give these things, and it says unidentified objects, to Agnes Lee, who was an ex-girlfriend. Tell her I will always love her. Jeremy had just taken these pills, so he was not under the influence of these pills yet, and his mother is showing the police as they're arresting him so that they can get him help. And I mentioned Agnes in the suicide note. Supposedly, he had told Agnes that he had killed someone when he came back from the trip to Nevada, but she thought he was joking and was trying to play a trick on her. After he's arrested, the police take him to the hospital where they're going to get his stomach pumped due to the overdose on Dexedrine. While they're at the hospital, Jeremy is talking to police. They're questioning him about the crime. Police say he was lucid and calm. They tried to give him the Miranda rights, and he waives his Miranda rights, and he gives the police a confession at the hospital. After his stomach's been pumped? After his stomach has been pumped. In his confession, he said that when he forced Cherie into the stall, he was holding his hand against her mouth to keep her quiet. David came into the bathroom and looked over the stall. After he left, Jeremy said that two young women came into the bathroom and in order to keep Sharice quiet, his hold on her grew tighter and he attempted to strangle her. After the ladies left, he realized she wasn't dead and that she was still breathing. And he figured, oh, I have to put her out of her misery kind of thing. A mercy killing. A mercy killing. So then he put his left hand under her jaw and his right hand behind her skull. And he said he, quote, snapped her neck like you see on TV, like twisted it. However, poor little Sharice was still breathing after this, so he did it again. The second time he did this, it resulted in her death. In a final act of humiliation, because what Jeremy did to her, I guess, was not humiliating enough, he leaves her body in the toilet in the stall with her legs in the toilet bowl, and he kind of folded her over, so she was folded in half with her bottom part in the toilet bowl. I wonder if he was doing that so people wouldn't see her on the floor. That's a good guess. But she was found at 5 a.m., so she wasn't there very long. Around this time is when her father figures out that she's missing and he can't find her. I guess he was done with whatever he was doing at the casino. After he gives this confession at the hospital, they take him to the police station, and he gives his confession twice more on tape without an attorney present. After that... I wanted, I just wanted to leave, and uh, I noticed that the girl was still breathing, barely. I didn't want to leave her that way, so I, uh, I tried to break her neck. Can I ask you one question? Did you, when she was having this labored breathing, did you consider trying to give her a little bit of CPR yourself and then take off? He was then extradited to Las Vegas, but no commercial airline would fly him, and I'm not sure exactly why. So instead, he flew on a private jet. And all he could talk about on the flight to Vegas was everything he knew about the plane. He had a pilot's license and had his own plane. So in case you didn't realize it yet, his family is wealthy. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jeremy's family. Jeremy had been adopted at the age of 18 months by Winnie and John Strohmeyer. 
They ended up suing Los Angeles County and its adoption department in 1999 for a million dollars for not disclosing the mental health issues of Jeremy's birth mother, as well as her drug use. It was discovered that his birth mother had been hospitalized for chronic schizophrenia over 60 times. The Strohmeyers claim that the social worker involved in their adoption of Jeremy deliberately withheld this information from them, and had they known, they would not have adopted Jeremy. Winnie and John stated in their lawsuit that when they adopted him in 1980, they had indicated on the forms they completed that they did not want to adopt a child whose parents had any mental health issues. They said they would accept a child whose birth father was unknown and whose birth parents had a history of drug addiction, just not severe LSD use. The information that was provided to them about Jeremy's birth mother was that she had dropped out of high school in the 11th grade, and after she dropped out, she went to Europe with a drug dealer. When she returned to the U.S., she exhibited, quote, wild behavior and was unmanageable. By 1976, she was unable to care for herself, according to a probation report. And when she gave birth to Jeremy, she had been hospitalized for her mental health issues. The social worker involved in Jeremy's adoption also told Winnie and John that his mother had had another baby that she placed for adoption in 1975. Jeremy's family hired a team of defense counsel for him, and the team included the famed criminal defense attorney, Leslie Abramson. If you don't know who she is, she was the defense attorney for the Menendez brothers. Ah. They paid the team over a half a million dollars in legal fees, just to give you an idea. Damn. The defense team tried to suppress the confession that Jeremy made to police after his arrest, claiming he was illegally denied access to an attorney and that police took advantage of his medical state after his alleged suicide attempt. Didn't he make a couple confessions? Yeah, because he went to the police. He did it at the hospital and then he went to the police station and did it on record. However, police testified that Jeremy waived his Miranda rights And he had told them that dragging an attorney into it would have unnecessarily prolonged the legal proceedings, which would have been really hard on his family. The judge in this case ruled against the defense and decided that his confession would be played in trial. Leslie Abramson was planning on a defense that concentrated on getting a second degree murder conviction for Jeremy as opposed to first degree because she believed he was going to be convicted of murder. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) yes. Yes. I do, too. She said that Jeremy didn't remember committing the crimes due to his alcohol and drug abuse and that he was suffering from emotional distress and therefore he didn't possess the intent to be guilty of first degree murder. How can you say he didn't remember the crime when he talked about it days later? Right? I know. His defense team even implied that David Cash was the real killer instead of Jeremy because Jeremy said he didn't remember anything, and the only details he remembered is what David told him. Also part of her defense was that Jeremy had a genetic disposition to becoming a drug addict, and that at the time of the crime, he had been addicted to crystal meth for six months. That's not really much of a defense. (laughs) No, I don't think so. She argued that had Jeremy and his parents know that his biological parents had been drug abusers, he would have stayed away from drugs. Oh, Bullshit. Thank you. If I would have known I could be an addict, I would have never used drugs. Yeah, that supposedly is what they were trying to say. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. The prosecution, their case was, of course, planning to show that Jeremy had the necessary intent to be found guilty of first degree murder. They were planning to introduce evidence that Jeremy had hoarded pornography, specifically child pornography, on his computer. They found that on his hard drive? They found it on his hard drive. Further, he admitted to fantasizing about having sex with very young girls, ages five and six. To who? He did this on the internet. So he is a pedophile. I mean, I knew it, but I'm saying he's... He did this on an internet chat room, and it was done two days prior to Sharice's murder. So it's in his mind. But his attorney was going to argue that they couldn't prove that he was the one that actually wrote it in the chat room, although I'm sure they could somehow through IP addresses and all that. But they were also going to introduce evidence that his former girlfriend, Agnes, the one I mentioned in his suicide note, 
She was expecting to testify that Jeremy had asked her to dress up in little girl clothes and school uniforms for mm. before they had sex. His trial was set to start in September of 1988. However, hours before his trial was to start, Leslie Abramson entered into a plea bargain on his behalf, probably due in part that the judge in his case had ruled that some of the child porn that was found on his computer would be admissible evidence during his trial. His possible sentence, if found guilty, could have been death. However, the plea was Jeremy would plead guilty in exchange for taking the death penalty off the table. So Jeremy pled guilty on September 8th, 1988 to first-degree murder, first-degree kidnapping, sexual assault of a minor with substantial bodily harm. He was sentenced on October 14th, 1988 to four life sentences. One life sentence for each crime he pled to. He was ordered to serve these consecutively and not concurrently without the possibility of parole. So he's not going anywhere. Prior to his sentencing on October 14th, 1988, Jeremy was allowed to address the court. He expressed deep regret, sorrow, and guilt for what he had done. He apologized to Sharice's parents, Yolanda Manuel and Leroy Iverson, and said that if he could trade places with Sharice or bring her back somehow, he would. I bet you a million bucks, if he was free, he'd have done something like that again. I would not take that bet because I believe he would do this again. So he spoke about what happened that day. And I'm going to read you a little bit of what he said from his statement from the court. Quote, on the morning of May 25th, 1997, I was drinking beer and wandering aimlessly through casinos and arcades with David Cash. Everything I saw was through a drunken and drugged haze. I remember playing video games in one arcade where a little boy and a little girl were running around chasing each other. David and I spent several hours playing video games and waiting for David's father. He then goes on to say, quote, when the little kids started playing with me, I began playing with them. I know that on the arcade videotapes, it shows me chasing Sharice into the ladies room. This is the first time the chasing game we were playing involved the ladies bathroom. But in truth, I don't remember this. When I followed her in, it was only as part of the game. I never meant her any harm. I had no plan, no intentions, nothing. Inside the bathroom, I saw Sharice near the sinks. I thought she was getting some wet paper towels to throw at me as part of the game. Suddenly, she picks up a wet floor sign and swung it at me, hitting my arm. I remember feeling irrationally enraged at this and remember picking her up. This was the last thing I can remember until later on. I believe I blacked out for a period of time. When I came to, I was in the bathroom stall with this little girl who was unconscious, lying on her back in the toilet. I could hear two young female voices outside the stall. He goes on to say, can you imagine what it would be like to open your eyes not knowing where you were or how you got there? To find yourself looking down on a half-naked, dying little girl? Can you imagine the fear, the panic, the sickness that rushes over you as you realize that somehow... You have done something to this little girl to cause her to be dying, yet you don't remember doing anything? My blood is boiling right now. I am so irate. Is he expecting me to put myself in his situation and imagine how he must have suffered and the fear right? In him? Yes, the horror that he experienced. I need to bitch slap him. <laughs> I know. He then says, this is what happened to me. The panic overcame me. And I couldn't think straight. My only thought was to hide the fact that Sharice was there. I sat down on her to cover her up from view. After the two girls left, I had a feeling of total unreality and terror. I wanted to get out of there as soon as I could. But in my drunken and drugged out panic, I crazily felt that I couldn't leave the child in her suffering state. In this panic, I tried to stop her pain. And then I tried to get away from that horrible scene as fast as I could. He's such a fucking saint. I know. He makes me sick. He says, it's no comfort to me that I cannot remember all the details of what happened. I want to remember. I want to know. And I have tried to bring it back, but I can't. He probably fantasizes about it. <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm just angry. I know. He then goes on to say that apparently on the videotape, the casino security tape, that eight women entered the restroom while he was in there with Sharice. But he says, I can only remember the two. I was wondering, like, in a casino, wouldn't there be lots of people 
going in and out of a bathroom. Right. And he says, you know, he doesn't remember six of them. They were probably drunk too, though. I mean, we're probably. talking about 4 a.m. in a casino. I'm just imagining myself there. Then he talks about his false confession. And his he, false confession? The false confession that he made to police at the hospital and at the police station after. He starts off that section by talking about his suicide attempt and that it was precipitated by the fact that when he returned home to California after murdering Sharice, he was overwhelmed with the thoughts about how Sharice would still be alive if it wasn't for him and that he deserved to die. He said he took the bottle of Dexedrin, washed it down with a beer and whiskey to speed it up. And then after taking the pills, he sat down and wrote the suicide note. After finishing it, he laid down in bed. Then his mother came home unexpectedly. And so he said he ran from the house so he wouldn't have to face her. And that it wasn't to elude the police. Oh, Because the police are arriving at the same time. He said the police apprehended him and took him to the hospital where his stomach was pumped. And that he didn't feel the effects of the pills until after his stomach was pumped. So he was saying he was under the effects of the dexedrine when he gave his confession. It doesn't matter. He still did it. Right. But he's got to tell his story in court, apparently. Because he's a narcissist. Mm -hmm. They're all narcissists. He said he remembers feeling disconnected from the real world and like everything seemed to be happening to someone else. He said he was aware of the police officers that were in the room. And they were asking him questions, and he thought it would just be easier on his family if he just confessed. He said he started talking and told them everything he could remember, and that the parts he didn't remember, he just made up. And when he arrived to the police station with the officers that arrested him, he said he felt depressed and tired, then made the full recorded confession, and said he told them things he didn't remember, and they were either things that David Cash had told him or that he saw in the media. So what part was made up? What part did he not remember? Apparently the actual killing of Sharice. That little window, because he remembers everything leading up to it, him in the stall with his hands over her mouth, and then he remembers, oh my gosh, this little girl is now unconscious, but he doesn't remember those couple minutes in between. He went on to say that he tried to understand what led him to kill Sharice. He said on that day he was a drug addict, and that six months prior he had been an honor student was a senior in high school and was looking forward to going to college. And a pedophile. Right? He said he had plans to join the Air Force and fly planes for the rest of his life. He started to become filled with an unexplained rage and anger. And he knows now it had to do with the circumstances of his birth and how the adoption system in Los Angeles County hid details from his adoptive parents. Or he's a spoiled brat with urges that were getting to him. Right. And he says, you know, if my parents had known all these details, they could have gotten me help and therapy. So it's always somebody else's fault. It is. This whole thing is someone else's fault. Everything I'm telling you, like he takes no personal, I feel like no personal responsibility. You know who should take some personal responsibility? David Cash. Thank you. Are we going to talk about David Cash? Because I'm on fire. (laughs) Oh, we are going to talk about David Cash. Jeremy also accused his former girlfriend, Agnes of causing him torment that she fueled with his self-hatred. He was so mean about Agnes in this statement, which I thought was kind of funny considering in his suicide note, he said he loved her. What did she do that made him so angry? He said she taught him rejection, that she had had an abortion, and that she is the one that introduced him to meth. Now, if you thought his statement to the court was done, oh no. He then goes on to have a list of things of the good he wants to, to come out of this. He said adoptees should have access to their background information in the medical and social history. Which they do, do now. now because we do adoptions. He said closed adoptions are dangerous. No. Not, if, if that's what the birth mom wants, then that's what. Exactly. And if you have your medical and social history. You don't need the names. He said parents should watch their kids more closely. Okay. I agree with that. <laughs> and his parents probably should have watched him a little closer too. Mm-hmm. Everyone's parents. He said drugs, both prescription and illegal drugs, should have a tighter rein. He said the doctor who prescribed him the dexedrine knew he had abused crystal meth, but still prescribed him an amphetamine. Then he complained about his, quote, psychopathic girlfriends and morally rehensible sociopathic friends. What the hell did you just say? Apparently he's referring to Agnes and maybe David. 
as his morally reprehensible sociopathic friend? They're his friends. I know. You pick your friends. He said the teenage culture promotes violence, stresses early sexual experiences, and encourages hatred and rivalries. Yeah, that's true. He said the gaming industry should do better and that kids shouldn't be running around casinos, places where there's gaming, drinking, and nudity. Agreed. He said that neither him nor Sharice belonged in that casino at 4 a.m. That is true. He then took time to say that the child porn that was found on his computer was actually emailed to him in a zip file. So he didn't know what it was until he unzipped it. Who's he hanging out with <laughs> that's sending him child porn? He I have never accidentally... Gotten child porn? You haven't? I don't think... I have to look at my hard drive now. <laughs> Who knows? He said there was some photos of children mixed in with the adults, and he never asked for the file to be emailed to him. And he didn't seek it out. And I believe he said this because he was really upset that he was called a pedophile. Um, when you rape a seven-year-old. Thank you. I'm just saying. Sorry, you're a pedophile. And you're fantasizing about it online. Then he talks about his future. And he talks about he wants to make a contribution to the world. Okay, well, I believe in redemption. He said he can't let Sharice's death be in vain. And he can't let the love and support of his parents go wasted. And that he needed to do something meaningful with his life. He owed his parents and sister a lot because they gave him a lot of support throughout this whole ordeal, both financially and emotionally. And he said if it wasn't for them, he would have just taken the death penalty and that would have been it. He hopes that he works hard enough to make them proud of him one day. And that's the gist of his whole statement. He did make appeals, of course, even though he took a plea. And one of the things he tried to say during the appeal was that at the time of the trial, his biological father was in prison and his biological mother was in a mental hospital. So somehow those genes contributed to his behavior. And the significance of that is that he's not responsible for what he did. So that's basically what happened to Jeremy. But our story doesn't end here yet because we're going to talk about David Cash. So is Jeremy still in Yes, prison? Jeremy is serving out his four life sentences in prison. Did he do any good that you know of? Not that I know of. And I Googled this story a lot, and I did not find any articles about anything that he's done. So we have to talk a little bit about David. But before I tell you more about David, it's time for a shameless plug. Hey, everyone. If you go to our website, tntcrimes.com, you can find full unreleased episodes available for individual purchase you can also join our membership where you get unlimited access to all of our unreleased episodes and early releases mini episodes and so many other awesome things so go to tntcrimes.com and thanks again for all your support Okay, Talia, are you ready to hear more about David Cash Jr.? Yes. He witnesses Jeremy, his best friend, molesting Sharice in the bathroom of the casino. He didn't alert security or he didn't get any kind of help for Sharice. After Jeremy was arrested, Sharice's mother, Yolanda, wanted David to be charged as an accessory. However, the prosecutor said that David hadn't actually committed a crime, that what he did was maybe morally reprehensible, but it didn't constitute a crime. And at the time, back in 1988, Nevada didn't have any laws that required him to report the crime even. And there's a reason for that. Sometimes if you try to interfere with a crime, you can get hurt yourself. Yes, and there were cases when I worked at the attorney general's office where there'd be victims and someone would try to help the victim, like give CPR or something, and they could cause more damage to them and they got sued. Yes, it leaves you open for a personal lawsuit. However, even though he escaped being charged with a crime, he did not escape being tried in the court of public opinion. He earned the nickname of the Bad Samaritan. Time Magazine actually wrote a whole article about it and named it The Bad Samaritan. 
Do you know where the term Good Samaritan comes from? Is that something with the Bible, right? Yes. And I'll tell you quickly what the story is. It's about a man who was a Jew. He'd been attacked and robbed by thieves and left on the side of the road to die. As he's laying there, a priest and his assistant pass him, but neither help him. And it wasn't until a Samaritan, who was the name of people from Samaria, passed the man and rendered aid to him. The story is particularly significant because at the time, Jews and Samaritans hated one another. So back to David. Shortly after the crime, he was banned from attending his senior prom. And at the time of trial, he was a 19-year-old sophomore at the University of California, Berkeley, and he was studying nuclear engineering. When word got out that he was a student there and that he was the bad Samaritan, there were protests and students lobbied for him to be expelled. They were angry over statements they heard that David had made in the media, such as he had been quoted as saying he was going to sell the story to the media and that one movie company had offered him $21,000 for his story. He said of this, quote, I'll fucking get my money out of this. Oh, man. He told the LA Times that he wasn't going to lose sleep over the crime and he felt more sorry for Jeremy than Sharice because he had lost his best friend. And he didn't know Sharice. Wow, 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 wow. Okay. Do you remember the story of Polly Class? Of course. Her father, who became an activist against child molesters after Polly was kidnapped and killed, he spoke at one of the Berkeley protests and he said, quote, fate gave David Cash the opportunity to be heroic and he turned his back on that opportunity. He was in the singular position of being able to save a seven-year-old child, and he chose to do nothing. For that, he will have to answer to his own withered soul forever. While he was in college, he was interviewed by Ed Bradley, one of the reporters on the TV program 60 Minutes. As part of the segment, Ed and David are shown on the Berkeley campus with a group of other students who they had spontaneously assembled to give their thoughts about David and the crime. Throughout that little segment, David tried to convince those students of his reasons for not reporting the crime. But as you can imagine, it went poorly. What were his reasons? He's like, I didn't know her. I didn't didn't know know her. He didn't know her. I didn't know what was happening. What did he think was happening in the stall? He saw. Thank you. He did. The segment concluded with one student saying that David made him sick. And at the end of the interview, Ed asked David... If he could go back, what would he do differently? So you would think that he would have some sort of answer, like I would have went back and helped or something, right? Yeah. Yes, I would think that. No, David dug his heels in and doubled down on his stance. His answer was, quote, I don't feel there is much I could have done differently. That's insane. That is insane. You would think he would just be sociopathic enough to fake Saying the right thing. That's what I would have thought. Even Ted Bundy would be like, oh, I would have totally saved that little girl. You wouldn't have all these people angry at you. If you were just like, oh my God, I just panicked and I didn't know what to do. And so I didn't do anything. As a response to David not being charged with any crime, Nevada Assembly Speaker Richard Perkins at the time introduced the Sharice Iverson bill. That would require Nevada residents to notify police if they see someone committing a crime against a child. It was passed in 1999, and a similar law went into effect in California the following year. There was a law proposed at the federal level. It was the Sharice Iverson Act. It was introduced into the Senate by Barbara Boxer of California on September 9th, 1998. It proposed to amend the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. That would require states to pass legislation imposing a criminal penalty on witnessing child sexual abuse to those who fail to report it. I did some research and I did not find this as a federal law, so I believe it was not passed. And if you're wondering about what happened to David, he did graduate from Berkeley with a bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering. He did eventually get a job as an engineer working for an oil company. But someone sent the CEO of that company information about this case, and he was fired. Today, I don't know where David Cash is. I would imagine he's hiding under a rock somewhere. He should. And if I was him, I would change my name. 
Oh, definitely. And my attitude. Right? So that is the sad, sad story of the murder of Sharice Iverson and the Bad Samaritan. There's so many thoughts going through my head right now. So much anger. Jeremy is right. There are so many things that could have prevented this murder. It's just shocking to me. It's just a devastating story, Tanya. I know. I can't believe David, after seeing that, I don't care if he's your best friend or not, but after seeing something like that, then they went on to continue drinking and playing in the arcade like nothing happened, and then went back home to California again like nothing happened. And you know, Tanya, I was wondering when she picked up that wet floor sign and she was swinging it at him. Jeremy remembers that. So maybe Jeremy's not telling us that he's making lewd comments or something that's scaring Cherise. Maybe she's actually doing that to try to protect herself. That's a definite possibility. Because all of a sudden it turned from like hide and seek and throwing paper towels at one another to whipping a plastic sign at him. I Just a know. thought. Well, thank you for giving me all the details on that story. It is, it, it is definitely a tragedy. It definitely is. And I hope there's some good that came out of it. I know, like I mentioned, Nevada and California have laws. I think it may have developed into other things about mandatory reporting. So uh, maybe her death was not in vain. If you would like to see more about this case, some photos from the episode, that you can find them on our website, TNT Crimes. You can also find bonus episodes that you could purchase on our website, for 99 cents, or you can become a member. And if you'd like to become a member, you can visit patreon.com slash TNT crimes, and you will have access to the bonus episodes, mini episodes, and we do live episodes. And by becoming a member, you help support us because Tanya rely on the support of our members to make these. And if you don't want to become a member, you can still help us by, as Tanya said, purchasing an episode that's online only for 99 cents. Or you can go to our website and just make a one-time donation. Buy us a beer. Buy us a martini. It's on our (laughs) website, TNT Crimes. And if you haven't done so already, if you want to take just one second to subscribe, it really does help us. So anyway, we appreciate you all for listening. Thank you for listening this week. And Next week, Talia will have another intriguing episode. Absolutely. So until then, stay safe. Bye. Bye.